Vicks presents the Matinee Theater, starring Victor Jory. Vicks, the makers of Vicks Vapor Rub, Vicks Vatronol, Vicks Cough Drops, and Vicks Inhaler, brings you the Matinee Theater, starring Victor Jory in a most unusual Christmas play. A stable in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. First, here's a good thing to remember when you catch a cold. The best-known remedy for relieving miseries of colds is Vicks VapoRub. Ladies and gentlemen, today from the stage of the matinee theater, Vicks invites you to enjoy a modern miracle play. A different kind of Christmas story with a special meaning for all of us. A stable in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It's Christmas Eve, and behind the window of an exclusive Fifth Avenue club, two elderly men look out on the world with jaundiced eyes. In the sumptuous lounge of the club... There are only these two tonight, trying to conceal their loneliness at this festive time with bickering and cynicism. Oh, these chimes. I suppose we'll have to listen to those chimes all evening, Gordon. Yes, Christmas. The commercialism and hypocrisy of the whole thing turns my stomach down. Oh, well, that's something we agree on. It's all so obvious. Think of all those millions of people out there wrapping presents. Why? Only because they feel obligated. Or they're trying to bribe somebody. Oh, it'll take you all these years to learn that? And these Christmas cards. Nothing but assembly line sentiment. People buy a card, put it in an envelope, stick a stamp on it, and send it off saying, There, thank the Lord, he's taken care of. Uh, uh. Christmas cards are a system whereby people remember to forget you. Greetings of the season. Yes, yes. And when they get through sweeping out the tinsel and adding up their bills, they'll be back at each other's throats again. Look at these holly wreaths in the window. That Christmas tree with all its baubles. By George, I'm going to complain to the board of directors about this. Just needless expense. But I suppose I won't get anywhere. There's a prize collection of nitwits, our board of directors. No, no, no. Wait a minute, Gordon. Wait a minute. I resent that. Oh, I happen to be a member of that board. I apologize. I should have said they're all nitwits but one. Oh, well, thank you. And that one's a fool. Huh? Now, look here, Gordon. All uh, right, your... all right. You know, Townsend, I'll make you a wager. Uh, what's that? I'll bet not one in 50 people down there in the street knows the story of Christmas, of Bethlehem, the shepherd. Oh, they know the story, all right. The strange thing about it is that they believe it. You're right. The miracle of Bethlehem is a myth. Are you sure of that, sir? Hmm? Huh? What's that? Uh, who are you? You're new here, aren't you? Yes, I am. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, a substitute, eh? Uh, I suppose because some of the staff are home trimming their Christmas trees, celebrating. <laughs> we don't matter, of course. We just pay our dues. I'm here to serve you, gentlemen. And probably getting time and a half because it's Christmas Eve. Well, <clears throat> we want two hot toddies. That's the only real thing about Christmas, the club's toddies. Yes, sir. And hot means hot, not lukewarm. Wait, wait. Tell me something. Yes, sir? What did you mean just a moment ago when you said to me, are you sure of that? Well, sir, you said the story of Christmas, of Bethlehem, and the shepherds was a myth. Yes, yes, I said that. What about it? I'm sorry, sir. I must disagree with you. What do you mean by that? Well, sir, you see, the story of Christmas is true. I know that for a fact. It happened again only a year ago. Oh, stop talking in circles, man. Explain yourself. Just what are you driving at? The eternal story of Christmas, sir. It happened to real people. I heard about it from someone I know. Heard about it? From whom? Well, let's say he was a friend. He drove a truck carrying freight from here to Pittsburgh. Two or three of them traveled together, as you might say, in caravans. An ingenious beginning. Caravans of trucks, is it? Like camels in biblical days, eh? You might say so. All right, all right. Go on with your story. It was last Christmas Eve, just a year ago tonight, gentlemen. This friend of mine, his name is Michael, was driving through Jersey on the way to Pittsburgh, and this night he was alone on the road. The other drivers were home with their families. 
As he passed through towns along the way, he saw the houses and churches lighted up, and his heart was heavy with loneliness. Suddenly, snow began to fall, fall so thickly that he could hardly see anything ahead of him. Mike drove along slowly, feeling his way. And all at once, a figure of a man loomed up in the flood of his headlights, stood there motionless in the middle of the road. Mike had to slam on his brakes so that he wouldn't run over him. Hey, now, for the love of Mike, man, what do you mean, stand in the road like that? You could have got yourself rolled flatter than a pancake. Are you crazy? I'm sorry, mister, but I had to stop you. Yeah? A soldier, huh? Well, what's the idea? What do you want? Are you heading west? Sure, that's my general direction. Why? Well, could you give us a lift? Just a little way even into in some town, maybe? Uh, us? Yeah, me and my wife. Your wife? What, what are you talking about, soldier? I, I left her back at a big sign over there while I tried to stop you. Back of the sign? Hey, what? In... Look, it, it kind of protects it from the wind. We've got to get into some town quick, mister. Yes, you said that before. But what are you two doing out in a night like this? Well, you see, we were in a little tourist camp down the road, and there was no chance of getting a doctor there, so we thought we could pick up a ride. <laughs> Look, mister, my wife's going to have a baby. Well, for the love of... Why didn't you say so in the first place? What do you use your brains for, anyway, fella? Well, I... I... Yes, well, don't you know they've got to be kept warm? Now, now, go and get her. Oh, thanks, thanks. I'll only be a minute. Mm. Mary, Mary, it's okay. Hey, you run up against in the road, a fine thing, me a delivery boy for the stork. I must have seen that sign a hundred times. Golden Rule Department Store. Our slogan is, do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. <laughs> well, they, they couldn't have picked a better sign. Look, bud. Hurry up. Oh, we're ready, mister. Okay. Get in. Gosh, lady, you, you look half frozen. Oh, I am kind of cold. Well, when I shut the door, the engine will warm me up. Oh. Now, don't be afraid of crowding me. The seat's plenty wide for the... All set? Yes, sir. Okay. We'll find some place in the road and stop for some hot coffee. That'll thaw you out, ma'am. I, I don't know what we would have done if you hadn't stopped for Joe. It's going to be all right now, Mary, honey. He understands. Well, I wouldn't say that, Joe. Me being a bachelor, but like my mother used to put it, bless her soul, babies manage somehow to make their way into the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how far is it to the next town? Can we go a little faster? No, bud, you can't make time in the snow. Oh, don't worry, Joe. I'm all right, honest I am. Uh, where are you bound for, son? Oh, St. Louis. St. Louis. Boy, you've got a long way to go. Yeah. Hmm. But you see, that's where Mary was born. I see. Her folks still live there. She wanted to be there when we had our baby. Oh. There isn't much time left on my furlough, but I thought maybe we could make it. At least I'd know I was leaving her in good hands. Oh, everything will be fine, Joe. You'll see. Just... Just keep your arm around me. Hold me closer. Say, there's a blanket in back there. I'll put it around her, Joe. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> boy, oh, boy, this is a funny Christmas Eve for me to be spending Mike Riley with a family on his hands. <laughs> But don't think you're going to get away without paying me for the trip, folks. Oh, paying what? you? Sure. If the little one happens to be a boy, ma'am, you can pay me by making one of his names Michael. Oh, I think that could be arranged. Okay, we're all of one mind, then, are we? Fine. And back home, I've got the Christmas present already for the child. The self-same crib in which I was nursed and my father before me. Come all the way from Ireland, it did. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Joe was going to make a crib all by himself. Oh? You see, he was a carpenter before he went in the army. The best carpenter you ever saw. <laughs> no, no, honey, I wasn't that good. Never try to argue with a woman, Joe. What about that crib I'm going to give you? Now, now that's something for a baby to stretch himself in with plenty of rooms to kick his legs in the air. Ah, hand carved it is. All of it. And, and right at the head are two angels. <laughs> the little fella can't open his eyes without seeing them. And this fine crib with all the trimmings uh, uh, is yours, ma'am. Oh, we, we feel very proud to have you as a godfather, Mike. Thank you. Y you don't mind if I call you Mike? Uh, Mike it is, ma'am. The only time I get Michael is when I see it on my pay on board. <laughs> yeah, yeah I I'm always Joe. <laughs> Last man to call me Joseph was the minister who married us. Remember, honey? Yes, he was so nice. He said, Joseph, do you take this woman and marry and do you take this man? <laughs> Gee, my knees were so wobbly I could hardly stand. Yeah, I remember how funny you look. Uh, Watch yourself. Oh. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, 
Oh, nothing. I, I just feel a little sick. Mike, we, we've got to get it to a doctor. Oh. What can we do? Well, we're going as fast as we can. If we go any faster, we'll end up in the ditch. We're going to do our best, soldier. And that's about all we can do. Well, what's the rest of your story? Why did you stop? I just thought you might want your hot toddies, sir. Well, never mind the toddies. You go on. Yes, go on, Joseph. Uh, Joseph, the carpenter, and his wife, Mary. <laughs> uh, I must admit the first part of your story has a very ingenious parallel. <laughs> but where do we go from here? Well, the storm got worse and worse. And the truck staggered on through the blizzard. It uh, was a night that never seemed to end. Joe and Mary held on to each other desperately, like two frightened children. Mike was groping for words to help them. It, it wasn't easy. Uh, come out of it, you two, now, will you? Come out of it, now. No matter what happens, you have each other. <laughs> Think of me riding up and down this road day in, day out. You don't know what it means not to have someone you can put your arms around and love. Oh, I, I know, Mike, but Mary's hardly more than a kid, had so little time together. Why, we haven't even got... Uh, you don't know what you've got, son. You don't know what you've got compared to lots of other people. He's right, Joe. So right. Please listen to him. Now, you take a fellow like me, Mary. I go along the road passing by houses with all the lights shining out at me and the kids laughing and dogs barking and uh, people safe inside their houses. And it gives me an emptiness in my stomach. Because, you see, me and my truck, we could disappear into the darkness of the night and no one would care one way or the other. You know what I mean? We come into this world lonesome, and it's a wonderful thing when you can find someone to share it with you and feel all that emptiness. Well, what are you slowing down for, Mike? You stopping? Yeah, and not because we want to. Well, what is it, Mike? I'm afraid the radiator's frozen up. Gosh, it, it stopped. You're telling me. Mike, we got to think of something. Mary's feeling awful bad. And I'll keep your shirt on, son. Well, we we your... can't stay here in the middle of the road. No, no, we can't. Here, Joe, take this flashlight. Open the door. Right. Uh, what is that sign say on the other side of the road there? There. Uh, can you see? Yeah. There? One mile to Bethlehem. One mile to Bethlehem. Why, I know where we are. You're going to be okay, Mary. Okay. A mile. Might as well be a thousand miles right no, now. Not as bad as that, Joe. Uh, there's an old guy lives down the road a little way as much of a place it used to be a livery stable. And when horses went out of style, the old bird stuck a couple of gas pumps out in front. Yeah, but do you think he'll help us out? Sure, then? he'll help us. I buy gas from him, I do, all the while. He's one of those Pennsylvania Dutchmen. Folks call him Papa Bauer. Come yeah. on, Mary. Put your arms around my neck and I'll carry you. I'm, I'm sorry to be so much trouble, Mike. Trouble? Think nothing of it, kid. Take the flashlight, Joe. Yeah, yeah. All right. Huh. Huh. You're just a little wee bit of a girl, Mary. And I can hardly feel you in my arms. Here. You feel all right, honey? Of course. I know we're safe now, dear. The snow's getting deeper. Better stay here in the middle of the road, Mike. We'll be there in a minute. Let, let me hold your hand, Joe. Oh, sure, honey, sure. I, I'm scared. I'm scared, Joe. Hold on to her hand tight, Joe. That's what she wants more than anything else. I, I'm all right. I've got to be all right. You've got to hurry, Mike. <laughs> Where is this place? I, I can't see anything but snow. We'll get there, Joe. We've just got to keep going, too. Keep going. It's not far now. But look. Look, there, there it is. Where? Where? There. I knew it was around here. Uh, take take Mary, Joe. Let's, let's see yeah. if I can wake oh. up the old man. Oh. Come on, Bauer. Open up the door. I suppose he isn't home. He's got to be home. Bauer, wake up. Open your howl. Open it, Bob. Get Mike Riley. Come on downstairs. Make it snappy. Mike Riley? Yeah, and I got trouble on my hands. I've got to use your telephone. I need some hot water for my truck. It throws up down the road. I'll be right down, Mike. Just a chance to get me to get in my pants. Okay. We'll be inside in a minute, Mary. How are you feeling? Oh, fine, Mike. If you could only make Joe believe it. Don't worry about him. He believes it, don't you, Joe? Huh? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> You've got to forgive him, Mary. He can't help acting like a father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's right. Uh, that, that, that's all. Mary. Mary, she's fainted. Mary! Mary! Well, they waited a few minutes. Joe and Mike and Mary. Minutes that seemed like hours. Papa Bauer finally came down and let them in. And there they were, Mary and Joseph and Mike Riley, in a stable near Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> That's pretty good. Mary and Joseph and Mike Riley. Yeah, but uh, what about the shepherds and the wise men? Oh, they came. And there was a star, oh, too. Oh, come now. Would you like me to finish, John? By all means, I wouldn't miss this for the world. No, nor I. Go on. Well, Mike and Papa Bauer started calling up doctors for Mary. But it was Christmas Eve. And it didn't seem any of them were at home. They must have tried about 20 doctors, going right down the list. But all they got were maids who said they'd try and find Dr. So-and-so and tell him about it. They were getting desperate. Mary and Joe were upstairs in Papa Bauer's room. And they all knew Mary's baby would be born soon. Uh, this one's out, too. Ah, uh, my, my. What do you have to do to get a doctor around here, anyway? Well, Mike, is you know Christmas Eve? Yeah, well, look, you keep on the phone, Bauer. I, I'm going upstairs. Let me know if you have any luck. I keep my drum. How, how is she, Joe? Oh, I don't know. To get a doctor. The old man's still on the phone. You, you mean you can't find a doctor? Oh, Mike, it's not fair. You, you can't expect her to have a baby in a stable with no one to help her. Don't, don't worry, Joe. Please, darling. Don't worry. It's all right to say, but we're only kidding ourselves. Now, wait a minute, kid. Don't make it any worse for her. May, may I have some water? Sure, Mary. All the water you want. Here you are, honey. Thank you, dear. Now, you just sit down, Joe. No, 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 right here on the bed. Listen, Joe. You said something about a woman having a baby all by herself in a stable. Well, I'm not exactly a religious guy, but I can remember my grandfather telling me a story I never forgot. Oh, Mike, this is no time for stories. It's always time for this story, Joe. I can still see the old boy's gentle smile as he told it to me. It went something like this. The birth of young Jesus, he'd say, was a miraculous thing. It happened in those days that Joseph came to Bethlehem with his wife, Mary, who was great with child. There was no room at the inn for them, no accommodations. But there in a stable, she brought forth her firstborn child, a son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And because she didn't have a crib, she put him in a manger. Now, in that part of the country, near Bethlehem, in the Holy Land, there were some shepherds keeping watch over their flocks by night. And what do you suppose happened? An angel of the Lord came down to them. The glory of the Lord shone all around them. They were pretty scared, these shepherds. But the angel said to them, Ah, you don't have to be afraid. I'm bringing you tidings of great joy, which shall belong to all people. Right now, in the city of Bethlehem, a child is born. He's the savior of all men. And you'll find him lying in a manger. And suddenly, with the angel was a heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory be to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It's beautiful, Mike. I only wish I could have told it to you like my grandfather did. Mike, Mike, come a minute down. Well, I guess maybe Bauer caught up with the doctor. Oh, I hope so. I'll, I'll be right back. What is it, Bauer? Did you find the doctor? No, but listen. listen. Do you hear? Do I? Oh, wait a minute. That's police sirens. I wonder what is the trouble yet. I, I don't know. Hey, they're coming here. Is he coming? Uh, maybe now we can get some help. Don't you see? Maybe they can round up a doc or take Mary to a hospital. All right, you guys, come on, stick them up. It's okay, Chief. I got them covered. Now, what goes on here? 
Are you coppers nuts or something? Yeah, what do you want? You'll find out. Keep reaching for the ceiling. Now, wait a minute, you guys. And, and keep quiet, will you? There's somebody upstairs who needs a doctor and needs him back. We know all about it. We brought a doctor along. Did you hear that, Mike? Yeah. All right, Dr. Henshaw. I'll keep these two guys covered you upstairs. You too, Wilson. And be careful. They may be desperate. Okay, come on, Doc. Mr. Chief, what's the big idea? You phoned for a doctor, didn't you? Sure, but we... We didn't hope for this kind of service. I am a quiet, law-abiding man. Everybody knows Papa Bow. Never mind. Stand up against the wall, you two. Ah, what's your name? Mike Riley. I suppose you don't know anything about the stick-up at the country club tonight. Stick-up? Oh, listen, Chief, I'm a truck driver. I'm out to Pittsburgh. Ah, now I'll tell one. Well, it's true. My truck's parked just up the road with a frozen radiator. Hey, Swenson, go see if there's a truck around here. Yeah, Chief. What I can't understand is who sent you here. Yeah, all we did was phone for a doctor. And that's where you made your mistake. Huh? One of the doctors you phoned was Dr. Henshaw. The one upstairs. He's a member of the Bethlehem Vigilance Committee. The which? You heard me. A group of professional businessmen who make it a point to suppress crime. And what's the criminal about what's happening here? Quiet! Three members of the committee were at the country club when you pulled up that stick-up. Dr. Henshaw, lawyer Marshy... Mr. Davis, who owns the Golden Rule department store. And Dr. Henshaw has made phone and said there was a rush call out here. They put two and two together and called me at headquarters. Well, I'm afraid they're going to be surprised. Oh, yeah? We'll see who's surprised. The job was pulled by a mob of four. The fourth guy was a little slow on the getaway. As he was leaving, he saw a pendant that Mrs. Henshaw was wearing and stopped to rip it off. By the time he got to the door, the steward had a chance to get the gun out of his desk and he winked this fourth guy in the leg. So naturally, he'd be needing a doctor. And so these three wise guys think they can pin it on us. Chief, you may not know it, but you've seen a miracle happen tonight. I don't know what you're talking about. No. You will find out. It's okay now, Chief. What's okay, Wilson? We got here just in time. Where's the doc? Oh, he's upstairs. And you ought to see the little rascal who caused all this commotion. This ought to be good, Bauer. Yeah, yeah. I don't see what's so funny. You should have seen him, Chief. Sweet as a lamb. Huh? Didn't he make any fuss? Not a single yip out of him. Did he pull any rough stuff? Only grabbed hold of my finger. Wilson, you've been drinking. Now pull yourself together. Listen carefully. What did he say? Will he talk? Well, in a year, maybe. You can't expect too much. Wilson, what are you talking about? The baby, of course. The... the... Did you say a baby? <laughs> That's what he said. I heard him. Well, of all the flat foot. No, 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 Chief. Watch your language. There's a child in the house. I was going to kiss him, but Dr. Henshaw said I might give him germs. Did you hear that, Bauer? It's a him. Yeah. Is it not wonderful? I'm in my stable already. Now, listen. Will you be listening to him now? With a pair of lungs like those, there's no telling what he'll make of himself in the world. And now, Chief, if you'll, if you'll put that gun down, I'll be on my way upstairs. Why, uh... <laughs> I think I'll go with you. Oh, sure, and why not now? And you know, once the little darling sets his eyes on my beam and countenance, he'll be nothing but smiles. Uh, and, and while I'm at it, Chief, I'm going to ask him what he was doing at the country club tonight. <laughs> you know, he's much too young to be doing gallivanting. So you see, gentlemen, there was Mary, Joseph, and the baby in that stable in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. There were the doctor, the lawyer, and the merchant, three very wise and good men. And though they'd made quite a mistake, the police were there, too. <laughs> uh, shepherds of the law, you might call them. In many ways, it was like the story of that other Bethlehem. And as I said before, there was even a star. A star? Oh, Yes. Remember I said the policeman was trailing a stolen pendant? Yes. Well, that pendant was a star sapphire. And that's what the wise men and the shepherds were looking for when they arrived at Papa Bauer's stable. Well, uh, star sapphire. Think of that. And did these wise men of yours bring gifts? Yes, sir. The merchant, Mr. Davis, brought clothes for the baby from his store, dressed him fine and warm. And the doctor gave Mary and Joe a big Christmas dinner, brought it all the way out to Papa Bauer's. Mike was there and half the police force. And what about the lawyer? Oh, he did his part. 
He made all the arrangements for Mary and the baby to go to her folks in St. Louis in real style. Mm, what do you think of that? What do I think of it? I think it's one of the most heartwarming stories I ever heard. I think it calls for a drink. Right, and you must join us, waiter. Now, what do you say to some hot Christmas toddies? You're very kind, sir, but I must ask you to excuse me. Nonsense. Your story has turned what promised to be a long, dreary evening into a most enjoyable one. An evening I, I shall never forget. Eh, Gordon? I should say so. This is the first Christmas Eve in years that I haven't felt, uh, well... Lonely is the word you're looking for, Gordon. Yes, that's it. Lonely. If I may say so, gentlemen, there's never any need for loneliness. And especially at Christmas time. There's a cure for loneliness. And it's very simple. All you have to do is to find someone who is poor and unhappy. And bring them the warmth of charity and understanding. Now, if you'll excuse me. I have to attend to my duty. You know, Townsend, there's something strange about that fellow. Yes, but I I did enjoy his story. Townsend, maybe there's more to Christmas than we thought. Possibly we've built a shell around us, a shell through which the good things, the kind things can't get through. Yes, and I took a waiter to show it to us. Well, Townsend, I wonder what that fellow's doing about those tuddies. I'd better ring. Now, why do you suppose he wouldn't have a Christmas tuddy with us? Oh, I don't know. Probably yes, he's... Gentlemen. he's. did you ring? Oh, oh, it's you, Tom. Oh, I... Yes, Mr. Gordon. Naturally. Oh, I thought you were off tonight, Tom. Huh? Oh, no, sir. Not on Christmas Eve. Well, then why did you have that other man wait on us? Uh, other man? What other man? Why, the man who just left us. The man we've been talking to. I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. My station is just outside the door. Aside from you two gentlemen, I've seen no one enter or leave this room. What? Mm -hmm. That's right, sir. And I can assure you that we have no extra waiters on tonight. No extra waiters? What? Uh, what? Wait, wait, Gordon. All right, Tom. Please bring us three hot toddies. Did you say three, sir? Yes, Tom. Three. One for Mr. Gordon, one for me, and one for the, shall we say, the spirit of Christmas. This is Victor Jory, friends. I do hope you've enjoyed our Christmas play. And you know this is this Christmas is unusual because Americans will observe Christmas this year in many, many parts of the world in many different ways. Yes, in many different ways. As one small voice in the never-to-be-still spirit of Christmas, I want to express you the deep and sincere holiday wishes of all of us who bring you Vic's Matinee Theater. Our producers, our cast, our director, our writers, and our technical men... Mr. Warno and his orchestra, and our sponsor, Vix. To you, our audience, we say thanks for your many expressions of appreciation for our efforts, the knowledge that you're enjoying our productions, and to your relatives in the service of our country who can't be with you tomorrow, well, God bless them, and bring them back safely for another Christmas. Thank you, and a very Merry Christmas. Today's play was by David Victor and Herbert Little, Jr. and was based on an original story by Charles Taswell. It was directed by Richard Sandville. Next Sunday, Vic's Matinee Theater will bring you the story of a woman who couldn't spare the time for love and a man who changed her mind. The gay, romantic, paramount comedy in which Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray made such a delightful couple. Next week, No Time for Love, starring Victor Jory. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>